אצלנו בשמי קודשי. גורז ישע ימילה. אלה ברכת ואלה ועשיסי. אנחנו בשם אדוני אלוהינו נזכיר. המו קורו ונפוגו. אנחנו קמנו ונסדו. אדוני השיע אמרנו כי ענינו ימים קרים. Before we do the regular bus of the Ghani class, um, being today is the 12th day of Kislev, and Sunday is the Adal of Kislev, the 14th of Kislev. <coughs> 14th of Kislev is the wedding date of the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin. So you will see, you will hear people celebrating, Pabrengen, you're having something in the dorm, which will be a little bit different and we'll focus on the role of a woman or marriage. I want to talk a little bit about the day you just kissed them from a Hasidic perspective. So first of all, I want to let you know we have this booklet. This booklet is an English translation of a Hasid of the previous Rebbe that wrote down in his diary. It was only discovered not that long ago, a few years ago, it was discovered by one of his relatives. And he was there, not only that, he was the Shomer of the Rebbe, which means he followed the Rebbe on the day of the wedding. <clears throat> Rabbi Altus, El Chaim Altus, and um, Leo Chaim Altus. And he, um, there's two things. First of all, he described a lot of details. And second of all, you can, it's like hearing from a chassid of the olden days, sharing his feelings, and you see uh, the depth of a chassid's feelings and perspective and love for the Rebbe, just the way they look at things from a, from a more spiritual perspective. So, number one, even though it might sound very normal to you, you might find out that in other circles, from religious Haredi so-called circles, they don't celebrate wedding anniversaries. It's nowhere in Shulchan Aruch. It's nowhere in Minhagim to celebrate a wedding anniversary. In fact, it's no different than birthdays. You don't find in Shulchan Aruch to celebrate weddings. The Shulchan Aruch says to observe a yard site when a person passes away, there's a big deal. There's different customs. What do you do and how do you act? and so on, but a uh, birthday, and same thing with weddings. <clears throat> the Rebbe did make an issue of a wedding day, and as we know, one of the Rebbe's time was to celebrate birthdays. <clears throat> so first of all, on a very simple level, the Rebbe is an expression in Gemara, Asis Lekarta Azal Kinemusa, it's Aramaic. But it means when you come to a city, follow its customs. Now, it doesn't mean we should um, uh, conform to the customs of the city. We have our customs as Jews. And as Jews, it doesn't matter which city we live, which country we live, we follow the Torah customs. But it means there's certain things which is done in different countries, and we should find a way to use those customs and turn it around to serve Hashem which means celebrating a birthday, celebrating an anniversary, we could use it in a positive way and in a way that could actually enhance Torah and mitzvahs. <clears throat> we found that the Rebbe celebrated publicly his 25th anniversary. And at that point, the Rebbe said a mimer in honor of the wedding. And in those days, the Rebbe... Bechlal, the Rebbe never edited his Maimorim initially in the years back. This Maimor he edited. In fact, that's the Maimor that Rebbe Chassan will now say by their wedding, the one that the Rebbe said at the 25th anniversary. So the question is, why is it such a significant date? So first of all, like I said before, there's a Pasuk often quoted in the Chassidus, Serve Hashem in all your ways. See, even things <coughs> takes him a few hours till he gets used to the day. <coughs> even things that are ordinary things, 
which will find a way to use it by Hashem. That's this one, one thing on a simple level. Second of all, anything that happens to a person in their life, something positive, you're supposed to thank Hashem. So when the day comes around, it makes sense to thank Hashem for the day that I was born. Like the Rebbe writes, imagine if a person was in a, God forbid, in a danger, and their life was saved. They're supposed to bring a korban called korban toda, korban of thanksgiving. Or today we make a bracha called hagaymo. So if a person thanks Hashem for saving their life, shouldn't he thank Hashem for giving my life in the first place? When is Hashem giving my life in the first place? On my birthday. So every year on the birthday would be the appropriate time to make the bracha. And why wouldn't it be good once enough? So the Rebbe points out, if a person was in a danger, let's say there was a, and someone in Israel was in a building, and miraculously they were saved from an explosion. They have to make the bracha. But not only they have to make the bracha, but if they go back to that place, they have to make the bracha again. If they haven't been there in 30 days. And if they go back again, they make the bracha. Their whole life, anytime they pass that spot, they have to make a bracha. Because that spot reminds me of what Hashem did. So the same thing with the birthday. The day that Hashem gave me my life was on my birthday. So every year when that spot comes around, it's not a spot in space, it's a spot in time, I make my bracha again. I thank Hashem again. But then there's a third point, and that, that applies to everyone, but even more with tzaddikim. We just read a parsha in the Chumash, where pages and pages in the Chumash Talk about the wedding of Yitzhak and Rivka. We know that in the Chumash, every word is counted for, and every letter is there for a reason. And we learn certain halachas from the fact that the Torah adds one letter. And here the Torah tells a story and elaborates on the story what Eliezer did and where he traveled and how he found Rivka and how she came back and how they get married. So Chsidisid explains. That every, and that's the content of the mimer that the previous Rebbe said at the Rebbe's wedding. The mimer has the famous uh, words of Lecha Doidi, which we say Friday night. Lecha Doidi Likras Kala. And um, that mimer also explains something related to the mimer we learned before that everything down here evolves from up there. So, therefore, men and women have neshamas that come from different places in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, there's also masculine and feminine. The masculine is Zah. Zah means the six spheres. Kasad, Gehura, Teferis, Netzah, Hojisod. And feminine is Malchus, the seventh sphere. And up there is a merging of these spheres. So merges and comes together, unites with Malchus. And when Zah unites with Malchus, just like down here, when husband and wife get married, they bring children into the world, new life. Same to the Milo, when Zohar and Malchus unite, it brings new godly light into the world. So when two people get married down here, it's a simcha because two people are getting married. But the truth is, on a spiritual realm, there's also things happening up there. That the spheres of Zohar and Malchus, which are connected to this chasen and this kala, up there, they unite, and that creates new lights. But the difference between Yitzhak and Rivka and everybody else, Yitzhak and everybody else, it's just a little dot in Zohar, a little dot in Malchus, and that because we're just ordinary individuals. But when someone like Yitzhak and Rivka get married, it says it's the actual entire sphere of Zohar and the entire sphere of Malchus that include in it all the details, they merge together. So it has an effect on a much more... Uh, much more general level, much more, we can't use the word global because we're talking about the spiritual realm, but on a, a level that affects all the world and everything. <clears throat> so naturally, what we're saying is that down here, when you celebrate a, a um, anniversary, it means that we're commemorating and remembering something that happened in the past. But when you understand that there's also a spiritual aspect to it, it means that every year, on the day of the wedding, whatever happened the first time spiritually reoccurs again, in fact, on a, even on a higher level than the first time. 
just like we talk about the holidays. I wanted to bring this in. There was one year, Tavshin Nun Beis, where the Rebbe handed out to every single person a booklet that had all the Maimarim that the three the Rebbe said at the Rebbe's wedding. It was Yudal at Kislev. Maybe I'll run across and bring it for the next class. I'll show it to you. And um, and and this is because when the Rebbe got married, there were a lot of Maimarim that the three the Rebbe said. And all those Maimarim put together in one booklet. First of all, a chasen gets called up to the Torah. So that Shabbos, which is for the girls, it's called Shabbos Kala. By the Bachram, it's called the Shabbos of the Ufruk. Ufruk is a Yiddish word, but it means it's the Shabbos that gets called up to the Torah. In fact, in that moment, the free Rebbe gives an interesting explanation. Why does the chasen get called up to the Torah Shabbos before his wedding? What's the connection? And he says, because it says that Hashem created the world through Torah and with Torah. Hashem looked into the Torah, created the world. And the Medrash gives a muscle of an architect. An architect makes blueprints. What are blueprints? That when we're going to build this house, we look at the papers and we see here's a door and here's a wall and here's a window and here's the staircase. And that's how they build. The Torah are the blueprint with which Hashem builds the world. That's the mushal. The nimshal means that through Torah, the world becomes created. Being that this chassan is now going to build his own personal world. So first, he has to get called up to the Torah. First comes Torah, and then through Torah, he can now build his own personal world. The wedding, at that time, the previous Rebbe was living in Riga. Riga is a, in Latvia. So the opera was in Riga, but for the wedding, the free Rebbe traveled to Poland. That's where the wedding was, in Poland. And, um, and the wedding had two parts to it. One part was the chuppah, and the other part was the actual wedding hall with, his, with the male. So the chuppah, the free Rebbe said he wanted it to be, the chuppah is the more spiritual part of the wedding. That should be in the yeshiva. The reason why he made the wedding in Poland, not in Riga, where he lived. Officially, it was because he wanted the wedding to be in the yeshiva Tom Chitmim. And the yeshiva Tom Chitmim at that time was in Poland in the city called Atwatsk. So the chuppah was in the yeshiva. But then the wedding was in this wedding hall. It was huge. It was about 5,000 people that, that attended the wedding. And he described some things here, interesting things about the wedding. But the three Rebbe said a mimer when they were called up to the Torah, that Shabbos. Then we don't do this custom now. Maybe it's a custom only for a Rebbe. But the night before the wedding, there was also a sort of a meal. And the three Rebbe said a mimer by that meal. Then at the wedding itself, by the Kabbalah Spanan, <clears throat> he said another mimer. By Kabbalah Spanan, that's before the chuppah. And then at the wedding, after the chuppah, <clears throat> he said another mimer. By the Sheva Brachas, he said, my marim. All these my marim were put together in one booklet, and it's called Drushe Chasna, means the my marim of the wedding. <clears throat> Again, an interesting story to see what a chasid is and what is the, what is the dedication of a chasid to a Rebbe. The Rebbe was engaged for a long time. You know, the Rebbe tells everybody to get engaged very quickly, but he himself was engaged for a long time. And, uh, or people knew that the Rebbe was getting engaged, but it was a long time. One of the reasons behind it, the Frida Rebbe apparently wanted the wedding to be, that's what, that's what they say. I don't know if it's written anywhere, or this is just known, that the Frida Rebbe wanted the wedding to be in a very big scale. Now, the Frida Rebbe had three daughters. None of the daughters, none of the other two daughters had a wedding on a big scale. And only by the Rebbe, the Free Rebbe wanted it to be on a big scale. Clearly, the Free Rebbe knew that the Rebbe is going to be his successor. But this was after the Free Rebbe left Russia. It was during the communist regime in Russia. And the Rebbe's family and the Hasidim were broke. There was no money to make such a wedding. And it was so important that this wedding should be sort of a royal wedding and on a big scale that the Free Rebbe was waiting. There was a chassid in Israel. His name is Avram Parij. 
And he found, in the street, he found a bag that had tens of thousands of, of, of whatever currency, thousands, whatever they had there in Israel at that time. We're talking about 19, 1928. Yeah. What? Lira? So it was a huge amount of money. What was the first thought that came to his head? First thought that came to his head, I can send this money to the Rebbe and I'll be able to make the wedding. He was afraid that as the Yitzhar will come and say, wait a second, wait a second, calm down. You can, you can send the Rebbe 10%. You don't have to take everything away. And, or the Yitzhar will come along and say, you know, you can keep yourself 10% and send the Rebbe 90%, but not send away the whole thing. So he wanted to make sure that the Yitzhar doesn't go anywhere. He went straight to the bank. He deposited the money, wired the money immediately, whatever method they used to Poland, that that one penny stays with him, all going to go to the Rebbe, so we'll have the money for the wedding. And shortly after that came the plans for the penny. So <clears throat> that was how that, and that's how that worked. And uh, the wedding day itself, the wedding itself, like I said, the Freak Rebbe wanted it to be a royal wedding. Obviously, he saw in the future that the Rebbe is the successor. The Rebbe himself said something. That year, we were celebrating the 25th anniversary. By the way, I want to tell you, even the Chassidim were a little bit, you know, eyebrows raised celebrating the anniversary. It wasn't a, it wasn't a common thing to do. Or even celebrating a birthday wasn't a common thing to do. But when the Rebbe had this Fabrengen, the Rebbe said, this day is the day that made the bond between me and, and you, meaning all the chassidim, and you and me. In other words, technically, how did the Rebbe come to become our Rebbe? Because he became the son-in-law of the previous Rebbe. And leadership goes from, you know, sometimes people question, how come all the Rebbes of Chabad were either sons of the previous Rebbe or son-in-laws? Just because they're in the family, they have to take over leadership. Why can't it be just one of the students, somebody who's a big chassid, will become the next rebbe? They don't, you know, in a secular perspective, it looks like they just want to hold it on, keep it in the family. But the truth is that people aren't even aware that there's a pasuk in Chumash that says that um, a, a king who is a leader of the Jewish people, the leadership goes over to his son or son-in-law if they are worthy. If they're not worthy, then you look elsewhere. But if they are worthy, they should be the ones chosen first. And the Gemara says, not only a son and son-in-law, but every, every position of leadership. So, for example, Moshe Rabbeinu, his son was not his successor because he wasn't on that level. So if he's in that level, which means in terms of Torah, wisdom, and fear of Hashem, Yerushamayim, then he at the position first. So the Freak Rebbe had no sons. The Rebbe was the son-in-law, two son-in-laws. And therefore, the leadership went over to him. <clears throat> and that's what it means that this day connected us because, again, everything is from Hashem, but the way it worked out was that he became the son-in-law. And as a result of that, he became our Rebbe and we became connected to him. One of the heavenly things that happened by the wedding was that the Freak Rebbe said a maimer. Before he said the Maimir, he gave a little introduction. And he said that at every wedding, three generations of ancestors come to the wedding to give a bracha to the Chassan Kala. And this is by every year. The Mishamas from Ganeidu come, which means if someone's getting married, and thank God their parents are at the wedding, their grandparents are at the wedding, so their great grandparents and the great great grandparents and the great great grandparents, three generations come from Shemayim to the wedding to bless them to have um, a bracha for the wedding. Yep. How does that work if someone doesn't have Jewish ancestry that far back? Avram Avinu, Yitzhak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu. They're pretty good also. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, the free Rebbe said that's generally speaking, that's by every Jew unexcept, without exception. But there are certain exceptions that more than three generations come. And therefore, before I start, 
I'm going to, so he gave an introduction. I'm going to say something in the mimer that's going to be from the great great grandfather from the Chassan. And he listed the Alter Rebbe, the Mittal Rebbe, Tzemach Tzedek, Rebbe Marash, and the Rebbe Rashab. And he also added another name, which was the son of the Tzemach Tzedek. You know, the Rebbe is a descendant of the Tzemach Tzedek. But the Tzemach Tzedek had six sons. And the Rebbe is a descendant of the oldest of the six sons of the Tzemach Tzedek. His name was Baruch Shalom. So he said he's going to say words of Torah for him also. And the words of Torah that he's going to say, that's the invitation inviting these neshamas to come to the chuppah. By the way, that's one of the reasons why we have a candle by a chuppah. It's not because the chuppah is in the street, so it's dark at night with a candle, but it's because a neshama is connected to a candle. That's why we light a candle when a person passes away. And because the neshamas come to the chuppah, we hold a candle. And which neshama come to the chuppah? Three generations. Shlosha Dorot. Hmm. Our generation? No. Your parents. Okay. Your grandparents are alive. Your parents' parents. Uh, no. Okay, so by your parents. Ah, yeah. Yeah? Betach. Betach. Sabo Vesabta. Ma? Yes. Baruch Hashem. She is not a rich job. I'm not sure. So. זאת אומרת, מאה הסבא והסבתא שלוש דורות. הורים שלהם, הורים שלהם, הורים שלהם. We don't have to worry about space because they don't need to deal with space. Because there's a big crowd coming in that case. Three generations from the Chassan side to the Kawa side. So because when, when uh, especially by a Rebbe, the Rebbe is a continuation of all the Rebbes. When the priest Rebbe was in jail, the famous story with Judah Tamos, we know that the priest Rebbe was very firm with them, very strong. Whatever they said to him, he answered back exactly what he wanted to say. So one of the things is when he came there, they gave him a questionnaire to fill out. And, and the priest Rebbe didn't want to fill it out. So they said, okay, I'll ask you the questions and you give me the answers. So one question was, of course, the typical question, how old are you? The Rebbe said, 150-something years old. The pre Rebbe said, she looks up and said, are you cracking jokes here in this Palerica? This is the, the, the jail that everybody is petrified even to walk outside near the building, and you're making jokes there? And he said, no, this is very serious. I'm not here as an individual. I'm here as a continuation of my father. And, and the Rebbe Maharash, and the Tzemach Tzedek, and the Mitzvah Rebbe, and the Alter Rebbe, all together were 150-something years old. So at the wedding, all the Rebbe are there, because this is going to be their, their continuation. Now, there's another interesting thing that happened by the wedding, and this we find in the priest Rebbe wrote in his diary, in his notes, that he saw his father by the wedding, naturally, he was there, and his father told him, Mazel Tov for what you're wearing on your head. What does that mean? If you ever saw pictures of the pre Rebbe, you see on the pre Rebbe's head, that's called a strimo. It's fur. In Chabad, Hasidim don't wear that. But the Rebbe did wear it. Our Rebbe did not wear it. For whatever reason, we don't know. But the pre Rebbe, all the other Rebbeim wore this. Naturally, the pictures are during the week, so you don't see it. But the Rebbe Rashab only wore a shrimal when he's in the city of Lubavitch. But when he traveled, he never wore the shrimal. And this was something which his father commanded him do not wear the shrimal outside of Lubavitch. So he told the same to the previous Rebbe. During World War I, the Rebbe Rashab left the city of Lubavitch, and he went to another city called Rostov. And from that point on, he never wore the Shreimel again. And the Friedrich Rebbe didn't wear a Shreimel. At the Rebbe's wedding, the Friedrich Rebbe put on a Shreimel. And from that point on, he continued wearing the Shreimel. Here in America, you see pictures of the Friedrich Rebbe with the Shreimel, which obviously was taken on a day like Halamayr or Purim, days which are allowed to take pictures. So the question is, what happened? I don't know, but it does say that the priest of his father told him Mazel Tov, that now you put on the shtrimo. So apparently, 
my explanation, not mine, uh, explanation that a lot of people uh, share is that the Rebbe said once that after the Freeber went out of jail and he was freed from jail, it's very similar to the Alta Rebbe. And by the way, next week, we'll probably have a few classes on the whole story of Yutas Kislev and the significance of Yutas Kislev. But one of the things which are well known is that the Alta Rebbe said after going out of jail, he began to reveal Hasidus on a whole new level, like never known before. Even he himself revealed Hasidus one way before he was in jail, another way after in jail. To the point that amongst Hasidim, and even by the rabbis, when they would speak about certain maimah, they say, is this before Petersburg or after Petersburg? <clears throat> Same with the previous Rebbe. Where did we see a change by the previous Rebbe? So the Rebbe said, up until the time that he was in jail, the Friedrich Rebbe mainly was involved with Yudin in Russia, in Poland, in those places. After he went out of jail, slowly and gradually, the Friedrich Rebbe's influence spread literally to the globe. And it, especially when he came to America, he began to send Chassidim Shluchim to places around the world. So Chassidim became more global. And by the Rebbe, you know, it's a whole different level of global than it was by the Friedrich Rebbe. Friedrich Rebbe was a few places. By the Rebbe, it's literally, literally the globe. So it, the way people understood the story is that the Shrimal indicated that the Rebbe is sort of, his headquarters is the city of Lubavitch. Outside of Lubavitch, doesn't belong to Shrimal. But once Chabad spread and became global, then any place in the world is just as good as Lubavitch. That's pretty much what uh, the way a lot of people understand the story. Another thing which is also, again, heavenly, and that's so common that the free rebbe should speak so open, but he said a certain mimer when the Shabbos, when the previous rebbe was called up to the Torah. And then he repeated the same mimer by that male the night before the wedding. And he said publicly, that my father told me to repeat the same mimer. My father means the Rebbe Rashab, who is not here anymore physically, but obviously he saw him. And he told him to say the same mimer, but he should add a certain story of the Tzemach Tzedek. So if you look at the, uh, in, in this booklet, there's only one mimer printed, because the first and the second were both the same. But the mimer is printed with that additional story. What's the story? It starts with the Tzemach Tzedek. And there was a chassid that came to the Tzemach Tzedek and said, Rebbe, and wasn't an ordinary chassid, it was a prominent chassid, very learned, the chassidus, somebody who had a very uh, a very um, honorable position in the community, but he was complaining to the Tzemach Tzedek Rebbe that people in shul are stepping all over me. I say things they don't want to listen, and so on and so forth, complaining, and these were his words, they step all over me. So the free Rebbe said to him, who tells you to spread yourself out all over that wherever they step, they're going to be stepping on you. <laughs> I, I think of it as one of my children who used to love to play right there by the door where you walk through, mm -hmm. set up all the little menshalach, little people, the Lego, and play right there. And of course, as soon as somebody walks in, what do you do? You're messing everything up. Who tells you to Play over there, go to the side a little bit. So this person ever said, you spread yourself out all over the place. So wherever people step, they're stepping on you. Basically what it means is that the fact that people are stepping on you is because you want to be involved in everything. You want to be in control of everything. And then the Maimon talks about the idea of bitl. So uh, that's also was a heavenly thing that the Rebbe should say, that his father told him what to say, when to say, and so on. <clears throat> Another very big part of the story is that the Rebbe's parents did not attend the wedding. They didn't come to the wedding. Why not? Because the, the um, wonderful Russian communist government wouldn't allow them to go, to travel. So Rebbe Lev Yitzhak and Rebbe Tzachana, of course, could you imagine what it meant to parents that their son is getting married? And not only that, their son is getting married to the Rebbe's daughter. But they couldn't come to the wedding so the Rebbe Yitzhak decided he's going to make a celebration in his house. In those days, communist Russia, 
what they did was they forced people to live more in more smaller spaces. So if someone had a house, let's say, with five rooms, which he had a house with a few rooms, they forced him to give up half of his house to some another person who should live there. So the, all those rooms turned into maybe two rooms or whatever. The neighbor who lived on the other side of the wall was not a religious Jew. There were a lot of apparently such Jews in the city where he was a rogue, but he respected him very much. And he and he knew that he wanted to make a wedding celebration in his house. So he said to him, I will give up my space. We can take down this wall or whatever and the way he was to get in. And you can have the wedding and use my apartment as well. Rebbe Tzachana says, in those days, people were petrified to have an association with or someone like Rebbe Yitzchak because he was considered going against the government by spreading Yiddishkeit. Nevertheless, they loved him so much that she said, I think 300 people should be in here came to the wedding. What does it mean, the wedding? The celebration of the wedding. He said, a mimer, there was dancing and there was singing and um, and, the free, and the Rabbi Levi Yitzchak sent a, a, me, a bracha to the Rebbe by writing a telegram. But basically, they celebrated that night. I think it finished like five or six in the morning. Celebrated as if it was a wedding, and spiritually they were they were very much connected. So, who walked the Rebbe to the wedding? It was another relative that walked the Rebbe to the wedding, um, and 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 they were connected from there. <clears throat> There aren't any pictures of the wedding. Interesting. I guess in those days, taking a picture wasn't as simple as today. The only thing we have from the wedding is the you know is copies of the wedding invitation and things like that, but not the actual wedding itself. But I would strongly suggest if you have some time, especially on Shabbos, relax and read this very interesting. A lot of interesting things that he writes. Even though I just told you things, that's very general. Here you'll see more details. Do we have extras? There should be plenty. Yeah, this is extra. No more of the table. So it's all downstairs, I guess, on the on the middle floor. Yeah. Of course, the dates are also significant. The Rebbe always points out that the day of the wedding was the 14th of Kislev. We know that the 14th and the 15th, those are the days that the moon is a full moon. Well, Kislev is a very, as we spoke about in the beginning of the month, a very Thesidish month, a month of miracles. The miracles of Israel that are happening now fit into the perfect the picture. We started with Hanukkah, and miracles continue. We should see more miracles. Yesterday they announced that uh, that Syria now has become a place where Israel has free airspace. There's nothing, that, you know, there's, the, the defenses are totally down. They can fly over Syria without being concerned about anything, which means they can fly and do whatever they want to do with Iran without any fear, mm -hmm. which, is, which is, you know... Uh, I saw yesterday a clip of a Israeli general who was uh, not religious, obviously. And he says, you know, people are saying Mashiach is knocking on the door. And he starts laughing. He says, I don't know what to say. But he said, this is, a, this is a country that for over 50 years we've been fighting with them. And in 24 hours, wiped out and, 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 and flattened out and everything destroyed in a way like unknown before. Uh, like, in other words, I don't know about Mashiach, but something's going on. <laughs> I, I, I want to just say that the definition of a miracle is something that is not expected, predicted, thought that this could happen in the natural order. And that's what's happening now. That's even someone wrote that even the even the pilots who were flying the planes were sort of rubbing their eyes, like, are, are we really seeing things that flying, destroying 
ships, destroying planes, destroying airports, destroying everything that has no resistance whatsoever is just like a failed egg. So this is miraculous, and we should continue to see the miracles more and more. Okay, now we'll start the mimer again. <clears throat> we have four and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. So the last thing he said was on page 53, that he said that um, <clears throat> really every Yid inherently wants to be connected to Hashem and in reality can disconnect from Hashem. And the only reason why they do is because they're not aware that by doing an Avera, that's disconnecting. But if they would really know and understand, they would never do it. So now we're up to page 53 in the middle of the page, the bottom part. Varaya, the proof to this is, when it comes to a test, not an ordinary test. The test where they're trying to force the person, God forbid, to surrender, to give up his Jewish identity, to accept, you know, another religion. In that case, there's no room to make a mistake, and to think that I'm not disconnected from Hashem. You know, even people who go as far as marrying out, and I heard this more than once, when people who were considering marrying somebody who's not Jewish, what was their logic? But I'm Jewish, so my child is going to be Jewish, so why is it a problem? In other words, even going so far, they don't feel that this is disconnecting. And when they do realize it was connecting, then they they will pull back. I don't know if I told you this, because once a student actually came to the winter program, that student, and she said that she was going to marry somebody not Jewish, and everybody in her family, she was from a Sephardi background, was very unusual there, and they were begging and pleading and crying, nothing helped. People send her books, people send her recordings, people say, said, my room was packed with books and pamphlets and letters, and nothing worked. Then what happened was that she read somewhere that if she gets married to an Anju, her daughter can't marry a Kohen. I said, oh, if that's the case, no, forget it. <laughs> I never understood why they would bother me so much. She was here, we were learning chapter 18 in Tanya about this. She said, now I got it. In other words, in her mind, she was saying, I'm Jewish, my daughter's going to be Jewish. When I heard that my daughter can't marry a Kohen, by the way, there was a mistake what she was thinking. But she was thinking, I mean, my daughter is not as Jewish as anybody else. That I didn't want. In other words, once the Yid recognizes, I am disconnecting from my identity as a Jew, as, a, as being connected to Hashem, that they're ready to give up even this person who she loved and nothing in the world, nobody in the world could stop her. So same thing here. When, when a person is told to bow down to an idol, or a person is told to accept Christianity, otherwise they're going to kill that person, they feel that this is disconnecting, and when they feel disconnecting, they're ready even to give up their life. And like I mentioned to you, the fact that Yidin gave up their life, that's one thing. But the greater, most remarkable thing is that even Jews who were not observant of Torah and mitzvahs, even they gave up their life. And that's something which is beyond understanding. If Yiddishkeit was not as important to you throughout your lifetime, why at this point, just for whatever name you're going to have, why does it make such a difference that you were, you were just with it? And the answer is because once they recognize that it's cutting off, then Amakabu and the people also went through suffering. Like it's not just that they killed people, they killed, they suffered, if you know anything about the Spanish Inquisition, where they literally tortured people to death. And nevertheless, they gave up their life. Let's just finish here on page 54. They give up their life. Even Yidin that are on the lowest of levels and very lighthearted. Even people that do sins intentionally. Nevertheless, they're ready to give up their life to sanctify Hashem's name. If he shows in that case, he knows and he feels that this is separation. And to be separated, oh. 
the gazelle is chas v'shalom, the chas v'chalil, and if a man can't throw, ain't be chel v'shalom by his throat. But he can't do that, and he doesn't want to do that. And therefore, he uh, is ready to go to the point of giving up his life. We'll stop here. But other Averis, where he doesn't feel that this is disconnecting, those are the Averis that he's ready to uh, to do because he doesn't feel that this is disconnecting him from Hashem. Okay? Let me continue with that. Yes.